This is John Abrams, and this is The Variety Artist, episode 42. Last week, I interviewed Niels Dunker, and we opened the interview with his name, and then I got it wrong in some of my own graphics. It's fixed now. Just so you know, it's Niels Dunker. Niels, N-I-E-L-S, Dunker, D-U-I-N-K-E-R. Niels Dunker. But I opened the entire podcast with my story of Bitterman Jones, my dog. I got a lot of emails asking where I got his name. So here it is. My kids and I go to a pet smart. We see all sorts of different dogs, one with a broken leg and one with some big sinus problems. So there's all these different dogs that had all these different problems. I figured that's a lot, a big commitment. So finally, we see a couple holding this little dog and it looks like a little, um, maybe chocolate lab. He's cute as can be. I said, um, are you guys adopting that dog? And they said, well, we're not quite sure if we're going to adopt him or not. We're just looking at him for right now. And I said, well, let me see him. So I took him out of their hands and I took him, and I showed him to Lily and I showed him to Juna. And, and I said, what do you think of him? And they're like, well, we love him. And I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so I took it up to the counter and uh, we bought him. We had him chipped and did the whole thing, adopted him. We had the adoption agency uh, go to our house and check it out and make sure it was okay. So we took it right out of the hands of this poor couple. <laughs> I don't know if they even knew that we took him. They probably adopted some other dog. I'm happy about that. Anyway, we go home. We find out his name is Dipstick. I, that's got to be the worst name for a dog. He had a little black part on his tail. So his name was Dipstick. So we had within our family a kind of name the dog contest. And because my kids were young, uh, my younger one came up with, with Brownie and some different dog names. And my older kid was into the old Get Smart series. So she had the name 86 and Maxwell. And none of those really fit him. So at the time, we had just watched Arthur, the movie Arthur with Dudley Moore. And Arthur had a chauffeur. His chauffeur was named Bitumen. So we had a private joke amongst our family, and we'd always tell each other, uh, Bitumen, go to the refrigerator, get me some grapes. Bitumen, go fix me, uh, fix me up some food. Bitumen, go do this. Bitumen, go do that. So that was kind of our private joke within our family. After we tossed around a bunch of names for our dog, I said, I have it. I think we should name him Bitumen. And so then the kids agreed and we decided on Bitumen. So about two months later, we're watching all the Raiders of the Lost Ark series and we see Indiana Jones. And I don't know why, but we started calling him, our dog, Bitumen Jones. So we said, hey, Bitumen Jones, it's Bitumen Jones. So from then on, his name has been Bitumen Jones. You can find him, he has his own Facebook page. You can find him under Bitumen Jones. All right, this week, I'm interviewing one of the namesakes of Cax. For those of you that don't know, Cax is the Conference of Variety Family Entertainers. It's named after the K for Cadabra and the Ax for Steve Axtell of Axtell Expressions. I had him on my podcast, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And today's the day you'll hear from the founder of Cadabra himself. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. As a reading ambassador, he's coined the term magical storyteller for his unique approach to bringing books magically to life, which has brought him worldwide acclaim by peers as a mentor, consultant, and guru on the topic. He's the founder of Cadabra International, variety artist. I give you Mark Daniel. Hello, John. How's it going, Mark? I am lovely today. I hope you are. I am. I'm feeling good. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Cadabra and Cax and, and all sorts of things. But before we do that, uh, kind of tell us a little bit about your, your performing. What exactly do you do performing-wise? Of course, you mentioned the magical storyteller thing. This is kind of scary sounding. For over three decades, uh, I've been visiting schools and libraries, reading festivals around the country, and perfect for a journeyman performer, I suppose. 
Yeah, well, one of the things that impressed me about you when I was doing a lot of the research, you specialize in school assemblies, libraries. Kind of like what you do, by the way. <laughs> exactly what I do. <laughs> We're kind of like, yeah, kindred spirits, exactly. <laughs> but the difference between you and I is that your focus when you do these assemblies and libraries is books. What inspired you to be kind of the book guy? Well, it was easy for me. I mean, as a kid, I loved magic tricks. I loved reading. And so what better than a marriage of the two? It just, it was just perfectly normal. Why, why specifically books? Because I, I know that, that if, if you want bully prevention in Southern California, you go to John Abrams. If you want books where you're from, you go to Mark. Because I have, I have a passion to share that and to inspire kids. I mean, it's funny because the mission hasn't changed. Technology changes constantly and great leaps and bounds. But the main mission, inspiring and getting kids to read because it unlocks everything, is still the same. And it's, and it's probably even more important today than when I started, believe it or not. Yeah, and do you find that maybe in the future you might convert something over to Kindle or because more kids are, are reading, they're, they're in the Instagram era where it's, it's really quick or they'll read something on a Kindle or an electronic device? It, that is still very up in the air. As a matter of fact, when Warren Buffett says, you know, the digital applications have just not been accepted, then you've got to step back and go, whoa. Who knows how that's all going to settle out? It will, but it's still very much in flux. It's still very popular to just pick up a good old hardbound or softbound book and go to it. It is. And when my kids, now they're 20 and 26, when my kids were kids, we used to go to our local library mm -hmm. and we go to the friends of the library and they would have books for sale for 25 cents a piece, 50 yes. cents a piece. Yes. So we got the entire Dr. Seuss collection, I think for maybe $10 or I love $10. that. <laughs> yeah, and we'd read them to them every night. I, and that still happens. It's, I'm so excited that that still happens. However, it, the, the, the percentages are not anything like they used to be. Mm. The work is still cut out for us, and I talk to librarians and reading teachers about this all the time. It's a much more challenging road today. And kids are distracted by everything video. Without a doubt, video is king at the moment. Right. I know you're going to ask me about this later, I think, about sure. advice for, for beginning performers. Oh, yeah. It's the same with our entire culture. You can go to YouTube and you can get some really great information, but you don't get the whole story. You get part of the story. You can go to Google and get some incredible, incredible stuff, but you don't always find the whole story. So when you go to the books, when you go to the literature, it's all hiding there. It's all, what, what's the term, hiding, uh, the, the great saying, hiding in plain sight? Hiding in plain sight. It's there, A to Z, all of it. And that's why it's still so important. I just interviewed, what is his name? Last week, I just had an interview of the author of the book called Hiding in Plain Sight, Ben Robinson. Ben Robinson, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Just interviewed him last week, and he just published a book called Hiding in Plain Sight. I love that. He suggests that all the information is there. Everything oh. we need is there. How about that? Yeah. But sometimes it's hiding in plain sight. He's totally right about that. He is absolutely right. Do you find that kids' audiences have changed throughout the last, you said, three decades because your subject is books, but the audience has slowly changed throughout the years? Absolutely. Part of uh, staying in the marketplace and staying viable and having something important to, to say is to recognize these changes and, and work with them and to them. And again, talking to librarians and teachers all the time, they see this. I work faster now, which is kind of funny for a lot of people that know me because you know, I really am kind of the Andy Griffith, uh, Mr. Rogers combo. Uh -huh. I tend to like to take my time with stories. I find I have to edit a lot now. I have to I have to speed certain things up. I was inspired a few years ago. Um, Martin Lewis and, and Ken Scott inspired me to uh, learn the Tamasuda Ray, the, 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 the sticks that you throw and create different forms and shapes for storytelling, which is a, uh, a wonderful uh, but little known Japanese tradition. 
I took it and I found the perfect book to use with it. And I loved doing the routine, but it ran about 11 minutes. So I performed it about five or uh, maybe five years ago. Yeah. And I wanted to put it back in and I learned something. It's too slow. Mm. In that, in that five year period, it's now too slow. I have to rethink the whole thing if I ever want to do it again. No matter how interesting it is, they're like, okay, we've seen that. Let's move on to something else. Right. So I have to apply that that rule of thumb now with everything I, I do and analyze it. And, you know, we're constantly learning. We're constantly reinventing what we do to stay relevant. We must. The, the times of old when performers, and I, I've heard this constantly through the years at Cadaver and talking to other performers, and they would say, I've got my, my show. I'm set. I don't need anything else. I don't need to change it. I've got my show for life. <laughs> I think those times are gone. I have no idea how you can stay relevant and even in the business if, if that's your mindset. Things are changing around you. If somebody, if somebody wants a retro experience, then maybe you're the person to go to it with that with that uh, thought in mind. Otherwise, maybe not so much. Yeah, because things are changing so fast, especially with the internet. Things are changing so fast around us. We have to pay attention to that. We, we sure do. And, and, and everything that goes with it. <laughs> I was, was cracking up. Um, my sons are Instagram uh, guys. And so I was cracking up the family saying, I'm trying to learn Instagram. And they're like, aren't you about five years behind the trend? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, I'm finally catching up, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to tell you, when uh, you know, when I first started this out, of course, we had Yellow Pages and, and different Oh, things. yeah, sure. Yellow Pages and parenting magazines. And then I remember when I first got an email, and I thought it was a big deal, but I think I was three, three or four years behind the curve when I first got an email years ago. Uh, but that's true for us. Oh, how many times has Madonna reinvented herself over her career? Oh, yeah. And she's very smart. I mean, that's a good lesson to any of us who perform to really take stock of where we are and uh, and are we relevant? Well, any of the long-term famous people, Madonna, Cher? Yes, yes. <laughs> we're bringing up oldies now. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let, let, let's stop that. Let's talk about the magical storyteller. I noticed that you also do preschools. It's the joyful storyteller. Oh, you found that. Yes. That was kind of interesting. So what is the difference between the two? I'm a big believer in, and I don't know if this will be controversial or not, but I'm a big believer in separating your markets completely. Mm -hmm. I believe that I don't intermarry the school market or the library market, I keep them separate as possible. Same with the preschool market. Back in the day when I was the birthday party king of the area, mm -hmm. I made some discoveries early on when I was doing birthday parties. I discovered that, at least in my area, if you were the birthday party person, then you couldn't be the corporate person. You couldn't be the, you were not the go-to school person. You were the birthday person. Right. So at that time, I wanted to move out of that market and into the school market, into other markets. I clearly saw some, what's the term I want here uh, from, from uh, prospective clients. Uh, they just didn't, they couldn't see you fitting in other boxes. Right. They could see you doing what you did and doing it well, but they couldn't really see you moving uh, that way. So that's why I've kind of separated out all those uh, markets. I'm with you on that. When, I, when I'm lecturing, I talk about how it's really smart to specialize, whether it's preschools or corporate you're talking about. or Yes, schools. yes. And yes. I have a number of different websites because I always say, say this. Say you are a person looking for an event. If you're looking for a corporate event, you're going to see two websites. You're going to see one that says, oh, I do preschools and I do family events and, and schools and I also do corporate events. That's one website. And then the other website you see does all corporate events. It's a guy in a nice suit doing close-up magic, mm -hmm. you know, with, mm -hmm. a, with a table that's nicely set with wine glasses and really nice silverware. So you see those two different websites, who are you going to call? I totally agree with you because people like to see you as, uh, as, as the expert of what they're looking for. Right. And I think if you're in the small market or small town, 
and you're the, the, the magic for all occasions or the puppets for all occasion, balloons for all occasions. That's fine because you're, you're the one go-to person. But if you're in a little bit bigger market, I think the more you specialize, the more you uh, have your niche areas, the more successful you'll be. And, and I discovered another secret, which um, uh, you have to walk the fine line with, is the magic of saying no. Mm. When I wanted to move into other um, arenas, I started saying no to a lot of things that weren't right for me mm -hmm. and can kind of controlling where I would be seen. And the more I did that, the more successful what I was doing became. So it, it was a, f a fascinating uh, uh, study. Hmm. I, I did stop doing birthday parties about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, believe it or not. It made me much happier not to do them. Right. I thought, well, gosh, if I can go to do what I love doing and be the happiest doing the different venues that, that I uh, prefer, then why not? Yeah, why not? Why not? That's why we started this business. I know. <laughs> I was just talking to a friend of mine right before, you, uh, right before we started talking, and he um, does colleges, cruise ships, whatnot. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I'm 95% happy with what I do. Mm -hmm. And I said, that puts you ahead of 95% of people on earth, I've heard. That's right. That's kind of wildly exciting. Yeah, we, we tend to think it's a normalcy, what mm -hmm. we do for a living. Yeah. Uh, but when I talk to my quote-unquote normal friends that have quote-unquote normal jobs, I'm smacked in the face with, yeah, what we do is not necessarily normal. <laughs> no, and when I'm working with normal people who work like, eight to five or nine yeah. to five, I, I forget that their mindset is that at five o'clock, their, their day is over. And at five o'clock, I'm sometimes only halfway into the middle of my day. And, <laughs> and that's, that's very odd to them. I don't know what five o'clock is. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's like, do I have a show at five? Do I have a show at seven? That's the only time I know that it's five o'clock. I, right? I know, right? <laughs> Well, tell me about your Easter egg roll at the White House. Oh, that was, uh, that was an adventure. Um, I get to go a couple of times. I know uh, Ken Scott's been several times. Mike Bent's been several times. We had a friend, uh, Ralph Metzler, Ralph the Great, who now lives in Las Vegas, who would organize those trips for us. They were absolutely incredible. Um, I, I mean, you know, you're, you're standing there on that lawn, and we would go in the day before, which was actually Easter Day, because the event happened on Easter Monday. Mm -hmm. We would take our equipment in, and we would be the only ones on that lawn. The performers would be. Uh, there would be uh, some ladies and guys around uh, setting up the displays and, and decorations. Then the Secret Service guy would come out and say, um, we're about to clear the lawn, <laughs> so we're going to corral you over here because the president's about to come in or the president's leaving. And... Who, who, was the, who was the president at that time? Uh, I went twice under George W. Okay. I have to tell you, it's, it, is a, it's, a, it really excites people to know that you've done something like this. It's a, it is a really neat thing for your resume. Well, it's a great promo shot, too. It's a great promo shot. Now, here's the downside. It's an outdoor gig. Often it was raining, and it was cold, and it was muddy, and oh. it was... <laughs> They do have a warm tent with uh, hot chocolate and finger foods that you can go uh, duck in out of the uh, extremes. And <laughs> I remember one year uh, uh, performing and it was pouring rain. But here's the crazy part. There were people standing watching because it's a big deal to get into this thing. And so they were excited to be there. They're like, rain, what rain? How does the general public get involved in that or... Uh, are they, are they, do they get an invitation? How does that work? They, they can apply for, uh, it's, I think it's like a lottery system there in the area. And some people can apply online and then come from around the country too. So it's, it's open to everyone. And uh, just, um, they just limit, they have to limit the numbers of uh, folks, but they'll usually see 10,000. Wow. <laughs> it's quite an event. I mean, it really is remarkable and it's, and it's, uh, it's nonpartisan. Of course, you've always, it's always, sponsored by whoever's president at the time, but sure, uh, people come from everywhere, all stripes. It's, it's really neat. Well, let's, let's, let's switch gears a bit and talk about uh, libraries. 
Uh, we talked a lot about schools, a little bit about libraries. Uh, libraries have a different theme every year. Every year, yes. Do you yeah. write a new show every year or do you do similar shows? About 34 of them so far, my friends. 34? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it. <laughs> that is crazy. So do you hold on to those shows? Like, did you hold on to the first few? You know, I don't. I really don't. Now, I may revisit a piece, but I'll, um, if I revisit a routine years later that might fit into the new uh, show, I'll cannibalize it. I'll, I'll take it completely apart and put it back together however I need to. Now, I, I, I've developed a formula over the years, and I kind of plug in uh, kind of pods. I think I see it in my mind, or cartridges in a way. To, uh, to create the programs, but, but yeah, the material changes each time and, and I may revisit it or I may never. Do you mind sharing some of that formula? One of these days I'll, I'll sit down and write it down. So it, it, I, it's something I, it's funny that you mentioned that I can do it automatically, but I have to really sit down and think about what it is I'm talking about and doing. It's, it's kind of like when you're, you know, when you're in your show and you start and you can go from beginning to finish without really even thinking about it. But if somebody asks you about a piece in the middle of the show and then you're thinking, okay, how do I pull? Does that make sense? It, it becomes much more complicated. Oh yeah. I can never do that. Okay. So anybody listening to this, watch for Mark's uh, next book that'll tell the formula of his library shows. <laughs> oh, and now some of that already exists, by the way. Oh, uh, because Sammy Smith sent a camera crew up several years ago. I was much younger, but the, the, uh, the, the basic format was starting to go in place at that time. The resulting video was called Book Magic, and mm -hmm. it's available on DVD from spsmagic.com. Ah. Sammy Smith, our, the linking ring editor of IBM, and prolific children's magician. Yeah, he's terrific. So tell me about the Imagination Library, your partnership with Dolly Parton. Oh, for many years with Cadabra, we had uh, the executive um, assistant at um, the Dollywood Foundation. Her name is Karen Wilson. She's a um, published children's author and black belt and really fascinating person. But her uncle was a professional magician. And I, I can't remember his, I was just thinking as you asked that, what his name was, but I can't remember it. But I met her when we were uh, in Pigeon Forge many years ago. We would do fundraiser each year, a fundraiser each year at the auction at Cadabra, then donate that money to um, the Imagination Library, which has just grown and grown and grown. It's now all over the world. It's in at least 11 or 12 countries and throughout the United States. Well, what exactly is that? It, it's really neat. So it, it is Dolly Parton's, uh, who is from uh, the Pigeon Forge Sevierville, Sevier County uh, area of Tennessee. It was her original concept for her county, and then she uh, realized that she could expand it worldwide. The concept is at no cost to the parents, they just sign up for the program, they uh, start receiving a book a month for their child. When their child is born, oh. they get a book a month until their child turns uh, five. Oh, that's great. And it may be throughout the fifth year, actually, but zero to five, that's the way for uh, uh, that family to establish a, a reading library for their children. And the community comes together and funds it and pays for it. It's a brilliant, brilliant program. And it's now in its, I don't, I think it's been going on for nearly 20 years. Was it year before last they passed their billion oh. book giveaway? Oh, wow. it's been huge, huge, wow. really, really neat program. I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, that, that, what a terrific program. Oh, it is. It is. And there's, I know there's a couple of other programs that exist around that are similar to it, but this, this is the, the biggest one and, and the most successful. Yeah. For Christmas, I just gave one of our neighbors who has two kids, one of the Shel Silverstein books. Oh, yes. Yes. Which I grew up with and my kids grew up with. Uh, they're wonderful. And it was funny because she looked and she's like, oh, a book. But then I said, but wait, you know, read these to your kids because you will have hours and hours and hours of enjoyment and create a better bond with your kids just with this one little present. Yes, it's, a tr it's because it's a treasure. It's gold. I talk about this all the time. It is absolutely buried gold, un unearthed. 
and all you have to do to receive it is just open the cover and start. Wow. Especially if you have kids, you know, you're reading with your kids. Oh, and that funny because I, I was doing the reading uh, programs before my children were born mm. and our twins are now 24. But once they were born, it just, you really do get all of the, uh, the, the impact of, of what happens as, as this unfolds. Yeah. And it teaches kids, well, it gives them a bit of your own personality, but it also teaches yes. them to speak early. It teaches yes. them to read early. When you read aloud, most, most kids will read well above their grade level. Amazing. It, it really works. <laughs> I love it. And, oh, and by the way, and you don't have to buy a big expensive program to go with it. That's true. You just need the book. Right, right. We're going to move on to fan questions. Would you like some fan questions, Mark? Sure. Absolutely. All right. My friend Doug Shear of Shear Genius, he's one of the top school assembly entertainers in the country, asks, how do you avoid the trap that I've seen so many magic of reading guys fall into? Their reading show is this. Here's a book. Here's a trick. Here's another book. Here's another trick. It starts to get a little redundant after the third book. So what's the secret of not falling into that trap, but building an actual show? Oh, well, number one, I love Doug. And uh, Doug is another genius, by the way, of the many geniuses I've been privileged to know in my lifetime. It's a great question. And it's a simple answer, believe it or not. It's so, again, it's hiding in plain sight. Yeah. The challenge, I think, for performers is to not think exclusively as a performer. If you're a magician, you have a tendency just to think like a magician. If you're a puppeteer, just, you know, and on and on it goes. It's important to meld that with also approaching it like as if you were a librarian. Hmm. If you are, if you're, if you're going to be a reading specialist in this area or, or want to be perceived as one, then you really should study what librarians study? You should you should you should look at their their sites. You should uh, read their materials. Uh, you should interview them, talk to them, see what's working, what's not. If you are willing to put that work in, you'll see the 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 product, your finished product, your your performance change drastically. Again, some of that formula is is on uh, Book Magic, uh, the DVD. And I always like to promote that for Sammy because uh, he did (laughs) such a nice job uh, putting that together. It's it's one of those things. I saw Mike Bent do uh, a lecture on comedy and I hope Mike doesn't mind if I cut to the secret of what he said. He said, you know, most folks, if they would spend five or 10 minutes just diagramming out and thinking about what would be funny with whatever their piece or the routine or the bit is, he said, they could be completely original. And I say that's the secret to doing a reading show. If you'll spend the time with the books thinking a little bit like a librarian, there's no way to stop you with the, with the success you can possibly have. That's great advice. Now, Doug Shear also asks, whatever happened to school show school? Oh, a little bit of history there. Oh, yeah, I've never God. heard of this. Thing. What is that? Well, School Show School um, began in, um, I was sitting in my friend Steve Kissel's kitchen in Norfolk, Virginia, and Steve said, hey, Mark, what would you think if we had a small gathering of people that did school shows? Because Steve was pursuing some at the time, and he was coming and seeing my shows, and I would stay with him when I was in the area, he and his wife, Alice, and he, he said, you know, he said, we could... He said, because we're already, we've already got a, um, a hotel for uh, Cir- Circus Magic is his long running uh, conference. And he said, we could just have this whole conference about the hows and whys of school shows. And I'm like, Steve, I love this idea. And I said, you know, something's been kind of in the back of my mind in that I would like to get a group of get together and not just focus on school shows, but everything kids show. And so both uh, Cadabra, which was born as International Festival of Children's Magicians, which is a mouthful, <laughs> and I even had to take a moment to say it, <laughs> and School Show School were born in that kitchen at the, uh, at the, uh, simultaneously, 
For three years, we did School Show School in Williamsburg, Virginia at the George Washington Inn. We had about 25 or 30 people each time. And the likes of Joe Romano oh, yeah. came out of that time and uh, Bruce Bray and oh, Ralph, Ralph Metzler, Ralph the Great was there. Mm-hmm. It was really an exciting time. We were always kind of a little disappointed. We couldn't, we could never manage to get a, a bigger group there, but the conferences were sensational. I mean, they were jam packed with stuff. Mm. Uh, at year three, Steve decided that Tammy and I would go on and do uh, International Festival of Children's Magicians, which would turn into Cadabra. And then he would continue School Show School as something called Comedy College. And then it became Family Entertainers Conference. It's, it's had several names through the years. And I, I talked to Steve the other day. I'm not sure that this still continues, but it did for many, many years on it. it and it kind of changed focuses along the way. Uh, it's a, it was a really neat project. Is this something that you might bring back at some point in time? You know, you, I, could see it, I could see it done as a master class. I could see it done uh, maybe even online. Never say never, my friend. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's move to Brett Bolich, who is also a SoCal member, yeah. by the way. Brett's a neat guy. Love Brett. Yes. He's a nice guy. He works very hard. Brett's so the great. Yes. He asks, uh, what was the process? I know this is a big question, but you can shorten it up if you like. What was the process from beginning to finish for your dino museum? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I guess I'm like a lot of artists and, and, and tell me if you're like this, but um, my friend Max Howard, who is our guru at, at Cadabra, uh, Emmy Award winning uh, magician, Max says, you know, I'm most in love and most favor the the current project I'm working on. (laughs) Well, I I go all in when I'm working on a new program. From the very beginning, as a kid, I loved magic tricks. I loved reading and I loved dinosaurs and comic comic books. Okay. So uh, today, my whole career in life revolves basically still around the same things. (laughs) (laughs) You're just a big kid now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't get my wife started. But anyway, <laughs> I love dinosaurs. I love going to museums. I love discovering everything I can about them. I've had some incredible dinosaur adventures over the last several years. Uh, some that are almost surreal that they're so cool. I started um, growing my collection of fossils many years ago, and it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. About eight years ago, I had an idea about wanting to maybe turn this into a museum that I would take into schools. Oh. And so it started very modestly as, a, as the small collection and we'd go in and set it up and, and the kids would come through. But over the time, over doing it, I had this vision for what I wanted to accomplish with it. I realized that my vision was a gigantic project Ultimately, it would involve every life skill, every bit of my um, esoteric (laughs) (laughs) learnings and leanings to fulfill uh, from uh, putting it together as if it were a show uh, and and putting it together with everything I've learned about putting conferences together and, and, and trade shows together. And, and so this culmination of this, and I've just launched the version 2.0 of it, the culmination of it is really exciting because it does it does combine all of those skills and disciplines and talents. So it really is one of the biggest projects I've ever pulled off. We take the museum into a school or a performing arts center. It takes a good portion of the day to uh, load in and set up. And then we can stay however long they would like for us to. Then a few hours to load out at the end. We do music and lighting and ambiance and set design and but all of this I have to I have to make sure I can fit it in the vehicle. So I'm now looking at maybe considering a larger vehicle <laughs> because <laughs> the collection and my ideas on how to produce this keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. That's a, that's a problem with collections, by the way. 
<laughs> you don't think of that when you just when you first start putting a show together, right? No, no. But now I'm like, will that crate fit in? The, I'm like, I, so I'm out with the tape measure before I do anything. I'm like, will this go in here now? What What am I going to have to leave behind if I add this piece? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but but this but that's really fun. Is that's fun for us? This yeah. Is, this is the challenge, the excitement of, of accomplishing it. And then being able to go out and actually present it is really, really fun. It's why we do what we do, I believe. It's the best job in the world. It is the best job. And, and, and for some reason, people will pay me to do this. I <laughs> Imagine that. I hope they never figure this out. But, I, you know, what's the, I would do it for free except for the bills. Yeah, except for the driving there and the driving back and the loading up. Exactly. <laughs> the performing part's easy. You know, that's the fun part. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the Dino Museum. We're going to go to Pete Ellison. Do you know Pete? I love Pete, too. Oh, Pete's a ge- another genius, by the way. <laughs> a, a, a truly a genius. He asks, uh, he says, Mark, you always have such a great attitude when around people. I can't imagine you having a bad show, in parentheses, yet they probably do happen from time to time. What stresses you out, and what does a bad show look like for you? You know, it's a, it's a great question, because we've always, my friend Adam and I have always laughed about this, that if you ask some performers, they've never had a bad show. And so Adam and I have figured out that they might, be fibbing a little bit <laughs> yeah, you think <laughs> because yeah yeah <laughs> yeah if they've done any amount of shows at all and it's funny because you know december can be the best of times and the worst of times in that regard and the last show of the year this year for me i i had i had just done all the shows prior to it everything ran like clockwork it was uh, you know with the regular chaos and schools and whatnot yeah which i'm totally used to but the last show I walk in of the year, I walk in and it traditional, and this is a show I've done for this particular school for years and years and years for a certain grade level. Mm-hmm. I walked in and the new PE teacher, the, the, the PE teacher who's known me for all the years, they're retired. The new PE teacher says, close the curtains because I don't want you to distract the kids, the okay. kids to be distracted while you're setting up. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Because it's real important for me to fill my environment. Even if I've been in the room many times, sure. I need to fill it that day. I need to get the, I need to get my distance ratios in. I need to see my, get all the perspectives. Plus things are set inside and outside of the stage with my set. And I'm like, okay, so that, so I'm already feeling a little handcuffed because that's not as free as I like to be, but you know, I'm flexible. All right. So my group comes in, we do the show, everything's fine. I, I am a very much a, a stickler for asking what finish times are yeah. so that I'm on schedule with schools. Me too. You, you kind of have to do that with schools. You have to. You have to. Because, and they constantly change, by the way, depending oh, yeah. on you, you ask at the school. <laughs> yeah. But there are certain things about the schedule, the bus schedule, the lunch schedule that you can't mess with. You've got to be on it. So I knew that, uh, that this was their celebration day and, uh, for, the, for the holidays and that it was a little bit more loosey-goosey. It always has been in the past. So my mistake was I had asked every day during the month. I didn't ask that day. Oh, the one time. The one time. So not, not only did I do the show, but for that particular group, because it, they're kind of grandfathered in, they got to pet the rabbit at the end. I never do that. I'm almost never, ever do that anymore. Mm-hmm. But this group does, and it was like 100 kids, and so they're all waiting in line. So I'm, I'm down on the floor after the program. They're doing this, and I look up, and people are on stage, and they're pulling out musical instruments. Oh, no. My set's on stage. Tammy's down with me. We're, we're greeting the kids as they're leaving, and there's all this activity that nobody's mentioned to me. <laughs> it looks like they're setting up for a concert, yeah. but they're, they're setting it up on the gym floor, which I'm a little bit relieved of. I finish. And all of a sudden there are all these lines of kids that are coming into this room. I guess it's the music teacher. There, there was a kind music teacher and there was a young music teacher who was really stressed out and a little bit scary. 
<laughs> <laughs> and the kind music teacher says, Mark, we're about to have a concert. And I said, oh, I said, well, I'll need to tear down. I need about 45 minutes to an hour. That's pretty much the standard. He goes, all right. He said, is it okay? Can we close the curtains and we're going to take you out the back way? I said, oh, well, that'd be fine. I've yeah. never been out the back way before all those times there because usually things were going on in the back. I said, that's totally fine. Then the young music teacher who was really freaked out, he uh, is very scary to me and the kids. I'm actually a little bit frightened of what's happening because I walk backstage and he has removed my items from chairs and tables and put them on the floor. Oh no. And in decades of performing, I've never had anybody go and touch my things before. That's right. I just stood there flabbergasted. I'm like, you know, it is what it is. It's December. It's uh, all of the hustle and bustle. This is highly unusual, but we're just kind of rolling with it. <laughs> Tammy and I get everything out and I catch my breath and I'm like, well, that was a new one. Every day is an adventure with what we do. And, and yep. you just learn to go, okay, <laughs> it's just regular Abby normal. Yeah, you just <laughs> smile and you roll with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Kadabra. From the founder of Kadabra International, what exactly is Kadabra? Well, uh, the, uh, the history is uh, once upon a time, I was um, a young full-time performer in my 20s. I was traveling around the country going to conferences. I was frustrated because at most traditional magic conventions, there would either be one kid show lecture or there would be none. Mm. Uh, then I started going to the clown conventions, which were really fun, but they, they seemed to be stuck in beginner's mode at that time, mm -hmm. not really realizing the full potential of, of what they could. And so I continued to be frustrated for a long, long time. Finally, it dawned on me, well, somebody should do a conference for, for people who do what we do. Yeah. And who do kids shows. My dad always taught me if, if it's to be, it's up to ye. <laughs> <laughs> if it's to be, it's up to ye. So I reluctantly became kind of the uh, <laughs> founder, director. Uh, and, and fortunately, uh, along with uh, my wife, Tammy, uh, in tow, uh, she has been a full equal partner to, uh, making this great adventure happen. And it's been, it's been an adventure, my friend. So did it start out as a conference or as an yes. association or how did, it, how did that all work? Conference, as a conference. And I, our first year in Williamsburg, Virginia, now I had partners to help uh, kick things off. Steve Kissel uh, was involved uh, heavily early on. We, we really had uh, extraordinary uh, uh, launch. We had, uh, uh, David Yen there. We had Trevor Lewis there. Sammy Smith was there. I think Warren Stevens was at that launch. Um, unbeknownst to me, David Kay was there attending. All big names. This is fantastic. So we knew we had something really good. And we had, um, I don't know, we had about 150 people there. I think that first conference. We felt good about it ready to do it again and we're still and Tammy and I are still doing it now yeah. all these years later well how did that transition from conference to association because I'm a part of Kadabra and right. you and I have never met I've never been to a Kadabra I am going to CAX yes I'm excited yes yes but I've never been to Kadabra but I am part of the Kadabra gang well at at year 10 of the conferences uh Dennis Dowie Den uh Den Dowie had gotten involved and was uh, doing our uh, Kadabra website at the time. And Dean's like, Mark, this would be, do you know what you have here? He said, you've got this whole family. He said, that would die to be, they would love to be an association. I, I looked at it and I'm like, he said, you could do chapters. And, uh, and I'm like, Dan, this is an amazing idea. So I, I credit him with, with that whole concept of that. Oh. So we launched year 10. Mm -hmm. with the association. So it was a conference that an association that grew out of a conference. So it kind of, it kind of happened in reverse yeah. to the normal way that it happens. It was really exciting to, uh, to do that. And we had 
the Cadaver Journal magazine from the get-go as well. And Sammy Smith was actually the editor of the Cadaver Journal for the first year, year and a half. And then he would assume the uh, editorship of the Linking Ring shortly mm-hmm. thereafter. Tammy took on the managing editor of, of the journal for the next several years. Now, unbeknownst to us, th- this is the fascinating part of all of this. As uh, culture changes and, and uh, time marches on, we didn't know it, but associations would soon be on kind of the downslide with, with the coming uh, recession and the change in the way millennials perceive joining groups. Yeah. And plus, we, we started to notice we were having some real struggles with the magazine a few years in. Mm-hmm. We love the magazine, so we switched it over to digital, and it just never was fully accepted as a digital publication. Well, guess what? N- uh, nowhere else has, it, has the digital been accepted either, so we, <laughs> we were not alone. So we, we, we did the uh, full association ex- uh, uh, experience for, uh, gosh, I guess – wow, uh, 15 years, mm-hmm. yes, 15 years, and then uh, decided to uh, close the association part uh, this past summer, uh, although still recognize our members for many, many years to come, obviously, as we continue the conferences. So uh, we've now shifted from association back to a big, wonderful family through the conferences. It is a big, wonderful family. And I I love your chapters. I'm a member of the SoCal chapter. Yes. And that has been just fabulous. It's a powerhouse chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got Buster and Annie and Joseph and... Yeah. yeah, Buster. In fact, I wrote down, listen to this. By the way, anybody who's listening to this, join a Cadabra chapter in your area because it's one of my favorite days of the month. We meet once a month, once every two months. You know, we critique each other's shows. We go see each other's shows. And let me read you this group. It's Robert Baxt, Christopher T. Magician, Annie Banani, who you mentioned, Buster Balloon, Joe Self, Joy the Clown, Pete Ellison, Susie, known as Schmoozy Herring. It's yeah, and, I love and, Susan, and yeah. more. If you want to be part of, of some of the best entertainers in your that's area. A, that's a powerhouse group, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't it? I know. Wow. <laughs> and I love the fact that you guys, um, you guys meet, and because I talked a lot to Joe and Buster about this, you guys meet largely without ego mm-hmm. and share and visit each other's shows. And that's been a, that's been a, a rougher go uh, in other areas with competitors a little bit uh, jealous of each other. You guys have, uh, you guys have just really put together some great group dynamics. I'm, I'm really, really proud of what you've done. If there's no jealousy and no competition, everybody wins. And yes. that's how we in Southern California feel about it. Yeah. And if, if everybody yes. can take on that idea that everybody wins, if you share ideas, then everybody will be successful. You just hit on a key factor. One of the great days of, of our year is, is being together at Cadabra, being together at CACS, mm-hmm. and, and also being together at showcases, because that's where you're with your people, you know, your, your tribe. It's fantastic. All right, now CAX, CAX is coming up uh, in yes. late January, which yes. I will be there and you will be there. Yes. Steve yes. Axtell will be there. Tell us about CAX. So, so Steve, sent, I can't remember if he called me or if he sent me an email. It was about seven years ago. And he said, hey, Mark, you ever thought about doing a Cadabra on the West Coast? And I said, well, certainly it's crossed my mind. He said, well, let's talk about it. So we started talking and my friend Adam says, I know everybody in the business and that's not true because if you know steve axtell knows everybody in the business yeah (laughs) so so together we know most everybody (laughs) in the business he said you know we can invite this friend and this friend and this friend i'm like oh wow and and he said you know we've got the proximity of la and hollywood and and it opens up uh, a group of people that you know are are easily accessible that aren't on the East coast. And I'm like, wow. And the exciting thing over the last few years is that uh, the resulting treasure is that yes, these, these wonderful people come and, and spend time and give 
And it is remarkable. And I do love the dynamic of the West Coast because there's so many talented people concentrated there. And plus, we've got people coming from all over the world uh, because of the uh, LAX, the ease of LAX and getting to uh, CACs. So now we've got this rich diversity of folks that, uh, that it's extraordinary to be a part of. So you mentioned Yasu is going to be there teaching uh, origami and, and different things. Uh, who else is, is going to be speaking? We've got uh, oh, the wonderful Scott Green is going to be there. Scott is uh, author, inventor, dad, and a former lawyer turned performer. I have a lot of friends who are former lawyers turned performers. <laughs> uh, he also has a terrific podcast. He's got, he's got a great podcast. I was just yeah. listening to, to he and Mario. Mario, the maker magician, is going to be with us. Mario mm-hmm. is phenomenal. Uh, has a style like nobody's business. So unique and fresh. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll love every second with, uh, with Mario. And Mario's wife, Katie, they call each other co-adventurers. Okay. They're kind of like Tammy and I, uh, they're a team and Katie is going to do marketing for us. And Tammy just took her marketing class. Katie is really on the cutting edge of what's uh, working in marketing today because marketing, I'm, I'm astounded. Used to be, I could mail out a thousand, 1500 flyers in August and book my school year. Yep. Me too. Once upon a time. Now you've got to do, uh, I do newsletters, I do mailings, I do email newsletters, I do uh, Facebook, I do, you know, I do all of this. You're never certain exactly what's going to hit at any given moment. So you have to do all of that. And it's sometimes you're like, ah, <laughs> but, it, but it is what it is today. Yeah. Um, and, and Katie really gets this and is a good teacher of, of the approaches. So, we're, so she'll be speaking about marketing. Absolutely. And of course, uh, one of the most creative people uh, in our industry, Barry Mitchell, will be there. Barry's always uh, uh, exciting to have in the house. Uh, Of course, uh, we'll do our evening with Steve Axtell, and Steve will be there uh, throughout the the weekend, the week. Oh, Annie Banani. Annie's going to do uh, storytelling with balloons. There's nobody better. There is nobody better. She's a friend of mine, and I've seen her show many times. There's nobody better. He's fabulous. And host the Balloon Jam also mm-hmm. for us. Uh, Colin Diamond's coming uh, from, from England. He was with us attending last year, and he's a great guy. He's going to uh, lecture and perform for us this year. Uh, and of course, Yasu, uh, with, with his really unique approach to magic, to origami, to storytelling, to just anything he does. Uh, he's so charming and such a wonderful, wonderful person and performer. He's the whole package. He's fabulous. I'm getting excited just talking to you. Oh, and of course, you know, uh, we've got Mallory Lewis coming, Sherry Lewis's daughter. Uh, Mallory's going to have Lamb Chop with her and Pat Brimmer, uh, Sherry's longtime assistant puppeteer, will be with us um, as well on Friday afternoon. And they'll uh, bring back the legacy and, and the memories and and celebration of uh, Sherry Lewis and, of course, Lamb Chop. I remember watching um, Lamb Chop and Sherry Lewis uh, when my kids were little. Um, we watched special after special, and, and Pat brought some of the costumes last year that Lamb Chop would wore, that, that Lamb Chop wore made by Bob Mackey. And I'm sitting there going, I remember that. I remember that. I'm like, oh. And, and that's, again, one of the neat things about being in, in the Hollywood area is that you have these, these incredible people that, that have done this stuff. It's fantastic. Yeah. And you're going to have them at CAX. Oh, and Joe Self, who is Giuseppe Reano on Facebook. Yep. Joe, uh, of course, is not only a master puppeteer and a, a former Muppet puppeteer, he's done lots of, he's puppeteered on many movies that, that like Men in Black and, and uh, the Flintstones. And, mm. oh, and he hosts our, our uh, late night Power of the Puppet event, which is always phenomenal and interesting. Incre- oh, Jay Johnson. Oh, Jay. <laughs> Jay's our, Jay is Wait, our official. On top of all that, Jay Johnson's going to be there. Jay's there. Jay is, uh, uh, he's a regular at CACS. Um, uh, we love having him. He is, uh, we consider him our guru. 
great stories, his lectures. Uh, he will put a custom lecture together for us that he could take and do at any uh, Fortune 500 company. And that's, and that's his gift to, to us. Uh, it, it's incredible, incredible. Oh the people that come and share and uh, one Mr. one Mr. Kenneth Scott will be with us. Have you, have you had the pleasure of, I, of Mr. Scott's? Yeah. I met Ken Scott only once in front of what used to be Hollywood magic with my friend, Robert Baxt. I was there. Oh getting yeah. Seeing and Robert are buddies. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and Robert says, oh, okay, this, this guy here's Ken Scott. This is John Abrams. And, and so we met, that's the only time we've actually talked in person. So I'm oh. looking forward to talking to him a little more. Ken, Ken is brilliant. He, can just perform the daylights out of uh, out of anything. He can take something and just figure it out every direction, and just and it becomes uh, just a masterpiece in his hands. Yeah, uh, and he's great, 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 great with kids. So, what are the dates on that? Ah, uh, twenty third through the twenty sixth of January. So we're just a month out. Can't wait. Great. And how can somebody sign up for that? If you will head over to cadabra.org, K-I-D-A-B-R-A.org, and click on the CACS uh, logo, it will take you right to all of the CACS pages and uh, the info, schedule, hotel travel, and registration info, all right there. And always happy to answer questions if somebody wants to Facebook me or um, uh, send a, uh, a message. But uh, and, and, and I'm promising... I'm promising no snow at Cax. <laughs> yeah, it's in Southern California. I don't think we've had we've had snow maybe twice in twenty or thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that was Cax. Right, so do you have some advice for the working pro? I think the best performers, the best performers, and this includes young performers and seasoned performers, is to always be a student. Mm. I am ultimately curious about everything and everyone. I love to explore and adventure. I love, uh, I love to ask questions and I love to uh, read and know about everything I can discover. I really believe that if you're always a performer, always a student, that you will be the best performer you can be. Your philosophy shows by creating Cadabra and uh, working with CACs, creating CACs. And if someone wants to continue their education, gee, where can they go in January? Ah, uh, there's the perfect place. All right, I'm going to ask you for a recommended book, and then we'll let you go. We've taken enough of your time. Uh, do you have a book that you would recommend to my audience? I do, I do, I do. Uh, so many, actually. But as a performer and always uh, looking for ideas and, and inspiration for new material, I love a set of books by Edwin Hooper, who was the founder of Supreme Magic in England. There's a set of books of his legacy uh, that were written by him called Edwin's Magic, Volumes mm -hmm. 1 through 4. And you can find these books today. I would check with Hocus Pocus. I, I've, I see them advertised lots of places. Uh, and you probably pay $100, $110 for the set. Uh, and they are a goldmine of ideas. And they teach you a lot about where what we do today comes from. So you'll see, the, uh, you'll see the people that originated a lot of what are considered acceptable standards today. It, it's, it's a very, very helpful treasure trove. And it's called Edwin's Magic? That is correct. By Edwin Hooper. H-O-O-P-E-R. Perfect. Stuff, supreme magic. You bet. Great Excellent. stuff. Well, thank you, Mark, for doing my show. That was fun. You're welcome. Thank you, John. And looking forward to spending time with you in uh, just a few weeks. Yeah, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be able to hang out, you and me and Steve Axtell and, and anybody listening to this. Anybody listening, you're invited. Come on. We're gonna, it's going to be awesome. Can't wait. Now, before I let you go, do you have any social media you'd like to promote? Oh, uh, the, uh, thank you. Uh, the Cadabra International members and friends page is very active. Folks are posting all kinds of interesting things. We're also keeping you up to date on the latest happenings with CACs and then Cadabra is coming in Atlanta for the first time ever in August. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be keeping you uh, updated on that. Cadabra International members and friends page. On Facebook. Yes. Thank you, my friend. Excellent. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you like this interview, share it on your social media. That's how we can spread the word and create an entire variety arts revolution. 
That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.